soy obrero del arte. Um, I'm from El Barrio in New York City, originally from Brooklyn. And um, I work as a teaching artist also with um, a folk culture organization and as the uh, interim director of another folk culture organization with young people. I was born in Brooklyn and um, when I was two, my mother went to Puerto Rico because um, her and my father had bought a house there. They met in Brooklyn. She's from Aguadilla, he's from Caguas, but they met in Brooklyn. And by the time I was two, they already had bought a house in Caguas. So my mother went to live it. And when I was six, we came back and I started first grade, not speaking a word of English. Um, I even had a translator, I remember. And uh, when I was 10, we moved to Long Island, where I uh, basically my upbringing was in Long Island. Were there a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans? In we Long were like one of the first Puerto Rican families in Central Island, Long Island, back in the 1970, 71. And um, it was an interesting time. Um, but then there was, um, you know, a lot of African American families started coming in also, and um, and there was also you know, the time a lot of racism and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting times, um, you know, Long Island. Uh, also a very uh, close mentality that you didn't realize, like I didn't realize a lot of things after I left Long Island, you know, mm -hmm. after high school, but while I was there, um, I was a Catholic school, I went to an old boy high school for two years, St. Anthony's in Smithtown, uh, then the public school in my town had a, a pilot program with art, so they brought in all these artists, art workers, um, and trained them to be teachers, they gave them like a, a summer program. <laughs> But they were all working artists, and it was incredible. And um, so all my classes were art. I had gone to, to to the old boys' school for two years, so I didn't have most of my credits. So all I took was basically art. They had one English class, art and theater, and it was incredible. The, like, the two most incredible years of my life. And basically, what defined me was my teachers were hippies and very political, and they made me aware. So my first real experiences with art had to do with political awakening. And you know, and then you know, listening to the music in that time, and a lot of artists were talking about what was happening in Vietnam and all of that. So you know, and then my teachers really educated us. And you know, I remember um, Mrs. Dunbar; she would bring in a little slide projector and show us all these images, going all the way back from you know the caveman to Andy Warhol. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, I always say that that was the most influential time of my life. And um, I actually visit her; she's 94. And I went to visit her with a cousin of mine, Mrs. Wow. Dun Mrs. Dunbar, and I told her that. I was able to tell her that um, she's the first person that ever made me realize that um, I could be an art maker. So, when did you, when did you have that aha moment that you you wanted to be an artist, or, or was it something that you knew at some point, or, or was it something that just sort of evolved? Yeah, I think I think in my case it was kind of more organic. Um, I remember in elementary school, second or third grade, um, because of my limited English, the teachers. Well, I remember before that, I think maybe first grade, a librarian. She was Latina. I think it was Mrs. Garcia. I don't really know, but I know she was Latina. She was young and pretty, and she we did little finger puppets, and I was fascinated with the little finger puppets and we put on a little show and I remember my mother went and <laughs> that was a big deal, yeah. But that was like my first performative experience, you know, plus I created the the puppet. And it's funny because now when I do installation work, I think back on that, I said, it was all there from the beginning, the mixture of theater and, and art, art, visual art. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, that started it and then the teacher started putting me into play so that I can practice my English and that started my love with theater. Mm -hmm. And I always remember uh, all through, from third grade all the way to college, I was in theater all my life, at least once a year. I remember in high school, I would stay behind and help the tech guys, because I loved the set builders and, and learning how to paint the flats. And you know, since I liked visual arts, so I gravitated toward that. So I, you know, I would get out of the rehearsal and go to it. So, so it was organic, I think, an organic process. And then, when we get to high school and I meet all these incredible teachers, not just Mrs. Dunbar, a lot of them, I, um, I, um, you know, I realized, wow, this is something I want to do, and especially theater, for some reason, was really 
quality of me. So um, before I uh, I continued, I was considering going to a few universities here, purchase, you know, thinking about theater. But um, my parents asked me if I wanted to go to Puerto Rico as a graduation president right after high school in 1977. Um, and I went. I went for a month. That turned into nine and a half years. Um, and it was all my political awakening from the Puerto Rican perspective um, that I never, never knew. You know, I, I got a general global awakening here, but over there it was very specific, and I realized that I was never taught any of this. And um, I became really angry. I went very to the left. Who was your biggest political influence at that at that point? At that point in my life, it was Julia de Burgos. Um, and interestingly enough, I, when I first got there, somebody gave me a poem of hers called Yo misma fui mi fruta. I never, I didn't even know who she was. And what does that mean in English? Uh, in English, it means I am my own path. And um, at that point, I was still in the closet because I had, you know, uh, I discovered I was, uh, well, I was, I always knew I was a homosexual, but I didn't know what that was. You know, when I think, when I was 10, I think I heard my uncle say, Joe, say the word pato, and I said, oh, that's what I knew. <laughs> that's what I knew. That was my, my, my reference point. Mm -hmm. But by then, I did, you know, I was really thinking about it and, um, and thinking about, you know, opening up to my family. And after I read that poem, Yo misma fui mi ruta, that was what convinced me because she has a line there that says, Yo quise ser como los hombres quisieran que yo fuese. Un intento de vida. Un juego al escondite con mi ser. It's like, oh. I, want, I tried to be like men wanted me to be. An attempt at life. A game of hide and seek with myself. And I was like, you know, <laughs> I came out of the closet. <laughs> And then I kept reading her, and she's political, and she talks about Bisu Campos, and she talks about, you know, you know, um, the system, and lo que estaba pasando, and, you know, and, and so, you know, that was my awakening, politically, you know, in many, many ways. Yeah. And um, to this day, she's one of my favorite Puerto Rican writers. So how do you work? What is your creative process? Um, usually, um, it's a project, for example, if I get invited into an exhibit or if, um, somebody invites me to help out and design something for a play or something. Um, I don't know if it's because of my ADD, but if I have a, a specific timeline, um, in respect to creating something, you know, from beginning to end. Now, creative process continuously, like... Um, I draw constantly, 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 constantly on the train, sitting down. I put on the news and I'm here drawing, you know, as long as I can hear it. <laughs> so it's like, and right now, like, I'm in this process of uh, moving to a, you know, uh, relocating. So I'm pulling things out and I'm seeing all these things, you know, from years and years ago. And I have journals from like I was 19, and half of them are in drawings. So. And it made me think about that question that you're asking about the creative process. I'm saying, I think, and I think this is true of a lot of art makers. I don't think, I think it's a continuous thing. It's even like an unconscious thing sometimes. But I think you're always, because it's funny, like sometimes I'm cutting an aguacate, and you know, put a stupid <laughs> thing, but you start playing with the cacara, and you say, <laughs> And one of my friends came over one day, she was like, so I got una cacara de aguacate, she was de verdad. She was like, <laughs> So I think that that's the process. For me though, like I'm very goal oriented and I think also because of my background in theater, the beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. So um, so I have projects in my mind, like um, usually an installation, like I have two installation um, design ideas um, uh, and for writing, like uh, with theater, I've been working on a musical about a woman from El Barrio called Linda Feliciano. I, um, she came here in 1939, she was 16. She met a Puerto Rican crooner um, when she was, when she got here, and uh, his name was Daniel Santos, he's a well-known. So I knew her for like 15 years, and I wrote her story down, and I've been working on this play since 1998. 
for one of the uh, projects now, for example. So again, that creative process has been taking all this time. Mm -hmm. It's been, you know, um, mostly because it's been a personal project, but I'm sure that if I would have had, you know, it would have been a commission for something, <laughs> I would have been, I would have right, been you a little bit, time ago. A, a little push, a little push there, you know, to get it done. So what would you say is integral to your work? To my work? Mm -hmm. in, in general. In general. Um, for me, that connection that I got from high school, I think it always has to speak a truth. Um, or say something, you know, cultural or, you know, to, to reflect a thought or an idea that, that's uplifting or that, um, that celebrates, even though I do have some, two or three pieces that are a little dark. Because I think that art does that too. You reflect on dark things. Um, and now maybe that I'm older and going into the woods, <laughs> my things may be a little darker. <laughs> I have time to reflect on those a little more. <laughs> but usually, um, you know, my work is, the themes are always, like with the taller, the, um, uh, the Puerto Rican print making workshop, Javier Tofino, um, one of the things that I really enjoy about that process is that that connection to the political part of the graphic, um, you know, art history, especially Puerto Rico and if I to finish with everybody, um, but it's also cultural and it talks about the people, it talks about celebrates the culture and the foods and the music. Um, so I've like, you know, I really enjoyed that work and creating all those images and again, beginning, middle and end, you know, I'm part of the workshop, they have portfolios, I've been with them for like four years now, five, and I've produced quite a bit of work, but that's because they have deadlines. Deadlines always help. Deadlines always help. So aside from Julia de Burgos, uh, what are your biggest influences and inspirations? Well, Pedro Aviso Campo. Um, in respect to like uh, a political understanding of the plight of people, um, even though like back then when I was younger I was very politicized, and but now that I'm older I'm a little more you know because I I grew up in Long Island I have friends from all over the world my niece is married guys from all over the world so we have a United Nations in my family so you start realizing that we have a lot more common things in common than apart you know. So, but what Pedro Aviso Campos, you know, influenced me in, in that respect is that um, you have to fight for what's right and, and for justice. So um, this is part of a, a portfolio done by the Taller. Uh, I think there's 12 women, 15 women, um, based on this book by Olga Jimenez de Wagenheim called Nationalist Heroines, Puerto Rican Women, History Forgot, 1930s to 1950s. It's really an incredible book. And so this is Isabel Rosado Morales. She's been in the Benditas all her life. Um, and I picked her because she reminded me of my mother's side of the family. They have this very thin skin and all the little freckles and all the little wrinkles, you know. They call it uh, Pierre de Papel. So I loved her face. In this portrait, she's 104 years old. How old? 104, right before she died. In this picture of her down here, there's a policewoman bringing her into the sand in Vieques. She was 95, protesting against the Marina in Vieques. Wow. And she was arrested. Incredible, right? So, so the piece is called um, uh, Presente, because that was the slogan that uh, the Nacionalistas used back then. They would always say their name and they would say Presente, you know. And, uh, and this is the book that it's based on. So this is an incredible amount of women in here that did a lot for Puerto Rico. And people think it's only about politics, but it's also about the culture and about the history and about the traditions, you know. And, um, and then you know, following in that vein, you know, you know, Mahatma Gandhi and, you know, Martin Luther King. Um, and then when I came here, 
you know, the New Yorican movement. I didn't know what a New Yorican was. And I knew that I had been going back and forth all my life between Puerto Rico and here. Um, but then I met Tato La Viera, who uh, became a friend and a mentor. And, uh, and he had a piece called Ni de aquí ni de allá. Not from here, not from there. Um, and that's how I felt. Ni de aquí ni de allá. You know. and, um, and then I realized that because in Puerto Rico I was told I was called a gringo and Long Island I was called spick. Mm. So there was always this dichotomy, you know, like culturally even. Um, and I was almost ashamed to say that I was from the United States and Puerto Rico. Because, you know, and I was treated very differently, even like in political circles, there were certain conversations that I was not part of, <laughs> you know, because I wasn't born there. I wasn't. So, um, so here, you know, now, you know, the, those are the influences that have sort of guided me up to now. Um, you know, and then Tato, La Viera, here in the New Yorker movement, and all these incredible poets, you know, that we have that that are doing their thing. You know, the young poets, Caridad de la Luz, and, you know, Maria Ortiz, and, you know, uh, Américo Casiano. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, Bobby Gonzalez. People doing their thing and, and moving the culture forward, and, um, and voices that, you know, like we I forever. And they influence you, you know. Like, I always, when I talk to the young people I work with, I always say, you'd be surprised where you can get you know, inspiration and, and good advice, you know, and, and, and I really believe that, and I think that in, in the arts, you know, that's part of the work also, so, and I don't have answer your question completely, but those are my influences in general, you know, the biggest influence in my life, though, is my mother, because um, she's the oldest 15, and uh, they took her out of school in third grade, so she can work, so the, the kids can eat. This is the thirties in Puerto Rico. A lot of poverty. But you know, she came in when she was nineteen. She met my dad, she started our family, she busted her chops so we can go to school. And she always, always, always believed in me because let me tell you, being an artist and being a homosexual in the Puerto Rican culture <laughs> especially back in those days. But my mother always supported me. And um, always encouraged me and told me you can be whatever you want to be and you know help me buy my art material <laughs> so yeah. sold my costumes for the yeah. for the theater you know my yeah. old man never went to see a play i was in but my mother went to all of them really? <laughs> oh yeah yeah because it was not a thing that you know men did uh -huh. you know the machine how would you say your personality is reflected in your work um I think my personality is reflected in, um, wow, that's a good question. How is my personality reflected in my work? I think my, my curiosity and my search for, for truth, we're talking about truth before, for, for, you know, la razón, you know, the reason for, you know, we're all here for a reason. So one thing I forgot to mention was that in Puerto Rico, I spent three and a half years in a seminary. And um, part of that search was, you know, um, dealing with my homosexuality. I wanted God to tell me that it was wrong because that's what I had learned in the church. And I was in an altar boy since I was a little boy. And I loved the church. Later on, I realized, because of the theater, <laughs> I love the pageantry, <laughs> and I love the incense, and the, the colores, and the flores, and the costumes, you know? <laughs> but, but I was, as a little child, you know, as a kid, you're, you totally believe it, just like when you read, you know, fairy tales, um, and, but this was a fairy tale based on reality, on, on a truth that was distorted by institutions, but I didn't know that, and I discovered that in the seminary, which is a great thing. Um, and I think that, to this day, my work reflects that search, that trying to find, you know, peace among the chaos, you know, of the society that we live in, but at the same time having this really strong sense that um, there's a lot more than that.
Martinez. I'm a folklorist um, with City Lore. I've been a folklorist there for many years. I'm also the co-artistic director of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And I guess um, today we were going to talk a little bit about um, the, the artwork of George Zavala. George Zavala, uh, an artist who re currently resides in East Harlem. And George's work, George's work is really interesting. George himself is not a folk artist, what we would consider a folk artist, in terms of um, following, you know, use, the use of traditional, traditional um, artwork that that has, has a community-based, um, a community-based, what do you call that, um, transmission and 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 sort of heritage of um, that has been passed down. I don't know if these passed down is a very passive word. People transmit their art between people, um, but. You know, there are different sorts of folk arts that we have in the Puerto Rican community, whether it be wood carving or Bejigante Max and Santos carving along with the wood carving, the bob and lace. George works, George works in all, a wealth of different materials, diverse array of different materials, in, and also in different forms. That while they're not folk arts, he, he uses the imagery and the imagery of, of folk arts throughout all his artwork. Now, some of the stuff is imagery from the island that it is part of Puerto Rican identity and, and Puerto Rican uh, images that Puerto Ricans um, are very, um, you know, drawn to. Whether it's things like the coqui, the, port, the the frog, the tree island from the frog, that um, people, Puerto Ricans really identify with because it's, the, it's, it's this frog that only is in Puerto Rico um, and Hawaii. They say now too. Um, the you know things like the, the Puerto Rican flag, you know, which uh, is, a, is, a, is an identifying sort of symbol politically and culturally. Um, but also George uses directly from folk arts, things like Bejigantes, a lot of his work have Bejigante figures. Bejigantes are the masked figures from Carnival and the St. James celebrations. Um, he also uses Taino symbols, the indigenous symbols of the island, um, from the original inhabitants of the island. They're sort of, um, the, they would make petroglyphs, um, rock carvings with these symbols that had represented, you know, the sun, um, goddesses, um, or, or different natural images. So. Um, and he, he, he incorporates them as well. And another thing that George does a lot of, which is also had a very meaningful to George, was the Three Kings imagery. And that's in a lot, and, and it goes through a lot of his artwork as well. Three Kings has become a day that he's just really been attached to. He does a lot of celebrating on that day as well. And for many Puerto Ricans, Three Kings Day obviously is, is a religious holiday. It is, if you're very religious, it's a religious holiday. It's part of the Catholic Church's canon of, of events. Um, Three kings arriving after the birth of Jesus, coming, you know, bring the gifts. So there's a religious component to it. But for many Puerto Ricans, three kings is also seen again as something to identify with, us, with a culturally. You may not be religious, or you may worship some, some other religious belief. But a lot of people, a lot of Puerto Ricans, tend to like three kings imagery because it sort of connects them to the to the island. And of course, um, three kings as well, not only as, as a holiday, but in Santos carving, where it was a really big tradition as well because um, Santos, and I think we talked about for another artist, Santos saw um, these like wooden carvings of different religious figures, saints, three kings, the Virgin, different um, variations of the Virgin Mary, were very important in a lot of households because at one point, you know, um, in the 19th century, a lot of, there weren't a lot of church parishes, there weren't a lot of priests around, and it was hard, the few that were around had to travel, couldn't always get to people's homes, especially if they were maybe high in the mountains or, um, you know, far from more populated areas. So these, these santos were things that people had in their home for devotional practices, a way to have some sort of devotional practices, um, but they wouldn't maybe able, weren't able to see priests or go to masses. So um, they have this like, longer history in, in a religious and traditional sense. Um, but I guess, again, they have become very much a part of um, connecting to our culture, another one of those symbols, like the flat, like the cookie, that we can connect to our culture. And George incorporates a lot of that into, um, into his artwork, um, whether it's painting, whether it's, it's sculpture itself. Um, and so that, I think, through George's work, runs a really deep connection with folk arts on the island. Um, again, he's not a folk artist, you know, he's not a traditional wood carver um, or Santos carver, but, you know, George, or, or, you know, a Vegante mask maker or anything, but George is really familiar with these celebrations and familiar with their background and the belief system around them. So when he incorporates them into his work, he's really bringing in that, that sort of, um, those beliefs and those images that people can connect to and, and really makes it more powerful for people to connect to because he sort of, his stuff is really grounded in 
in the um, you know the the grassroots culture where where these symbols come from, whether they're Benigantes, whether they're Three Kings. George is someone who has some roots on the island. He traveled there, went to school there. You know, has been there. Um, um, but you know, he is born here in New York City, lives here in New York City, so you know, really New York. And you know, in terms of like the Three Kings and Benigantes. Um, I, I can't speak to all that on the island, you know, how many Puerto Ricans see it, but I've heard other um, people talk about how there are certain cultural forms that we here on the, on the mainland and, you know, the diaspora sort of um, really connect more with, really connect with. Um, you know, do they have coquito contests over in Puerto Rico? You know, I, from what I heard, no. I mean, people probably drink it around the holiday. But Puerto Ricans here, like, really connect. And, and around the holiday season, they make coquito, the sort of, like, Puerto Rican eggnog. And now, not only do they make it and share it with people, but there, there's contests about it now, which are really popular and growing. Because it's almost, um, when you're missing something, when you're maybe not as connected to your roots, you have to almost work harder and, and make more of an effort to to um to show that and not 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 I think not just to maybe show off to people but to you know maybe to prove to yourself and to make that connection deeper you have to work harder at it or, so or to sustain that to sustain that, it you that, know that so relationship if you live on the island you don't have you don't have, if you live on the island you don't have any you don't have any doubt that you're Puerto Rican because you live on the island you grew up on the island but us here you know where, when you're when you're when you live sort of like a foot in both worlds you have to maybe sometimes remind yourself maybe remind other people but maybe just yourself also where that connection is so you find ways to really make that connection more and you know whether it's new york is you know having you know coquito contests and now there's i think there's pasteles contest too which i haven't been i haven't had a chance to go to but also making sure that we bring that imagery that reminds us of our of our roots into our artwork whatever that artwork might be and then, and some people might work in very, some people do work in very traditional genres and forms and media, but other people are like, find ways of, of other media that they like to work with and they can bring that, they can bring that imagery in. in well, that. As, as art is, art always evolves. You know, you take a little bit of what transpired before and you bring, artists bring their own vision to things and they merge, they create things sort of like salsa music and, how it took, you know, jazz and, and Cuban music and merged it to one and created a new genre of music. And, and we shouldn't forget so, about innovation too with artists because even though, even if you're doing a traditional art form, whether that traditional art form is wood carving, making, making, um, you know, vejigante maps or something, you're still, and you're working with a, a, a long tradition of, of a, a form that, that, that people have worked on for a long time. But individual artists still want to create their own put their own stamp on it, put their own individual thing on it, which all artists, the point of being an artist is also to create and to and innovate. So, so you, of course, are always going to be innovation. So there might be, you know, maybe there's some artists who are making vejigante masks, but using different colors that might deviate a little bit from the normal or making the, the sort of the snout from the vejigante mask like in a little bit different shape or something. Because again, people just sort of like, innovation is part of what keeps traditions thriving and surviving as they go forward. They don't get stale. There's a way for them to keep, you know, people can add, add, some, add something that, that's relevant to their lives, relevant to them, and, and keep that, that form going. So you, we hope to, a living art form should sort of be fluid. If it's a living art form, it should be fluid because people are individual artists are bringing their own, their own stamp, their own identity into it and, 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 and putting that into this traditional mold. So, um, you know, that's what a lot of the artists here do as well. You know, they might be making t-shirts, tote bags, you know, more commercial products or making, you know, paintings, um, but they're bringing, they're bringing all this sort of thing from their consciousness, from their experience in, into, that, into that work. Is there a common theme that runs through your body of work? Um. Well, you know, it's funny, um, the eye for the past few years has been running through my work. And why? Um, why the that's eye? That's the interesting thing. Well, the eye is because, well, first of all, I think it's again what we were talking about, the spiritual, because it's the third eye, which is one of the things that, uh, that I think it connects to. But I think it's also about, like, you know, the gaze. You know, um, when you paint, you know, you really, well, when you work in the arts, um, as you know, um, the eye is a very important part, you know. And, and when you work with a human image, you know, the eye is an important part. So it's about gazing out, but also gazing in. Another image that's repeated a lot of cultural images. 
semis, croquis. That's like the residue from Puerto Rico. And I remember years ago, and uh, another artist told me, ah, that's like very uh, touristy. You gotta give up those. Touristy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta give up those uh, Taino. And I go, touristy? Those are our ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he was Puerto Rican? He was Puerto Rican. Shame on yeah, him. I know, I know. So what what role does your work play in society? Oh, I don't I don't know. You know, it's funny. Oh, what, I, what would you what would you hope? Okay, um, you know it's funny because, like, I, I call myself an obrero del arte because the word artist. To me, is a little pretentious sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe because of the way it's been used historically also, but also because those teachers from high school, um, I remember them saying that. You know, you're an art maker. You're gonna make art. You're not. You know, your goal is not to be an artist, not to be famous, not to be, which is very popular now. Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, especially the young generation, mm -hmm. um, and it's all about um, following and about public exposure. And for me, art making has always been like a very personal thing, like a like a need that has to be. You know, mm -hmm. like I remember when I left the seminary, um, one of the uh, gentlemen, one of uh, priest, spiritual director, told me, um, well, now you have to find your passion. And that's going to be what you're going to do the rest of your life. Um, and that was it. That's what I've been doing ever since. You know, um, it's paid my rent all these years. Um, it hasn't, you know, given me enough to, like, invest in a lot of things, but I've traveled the world, I've met incredible people, I've had incredible experiences, and it's enriched me. And I hope that people who view the work will get a sense of appreciation of that process, but also of like, it will make them say, wow, you know, like, who is that person? You know, not me, but what they're looking at, the image. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, a, if it's an image, a cultural image, or what is that image saying to me? You know, is it, you know, that it's not just decorative and pretty, but that it has depth and that it speaks. Um, and it's funny because sometimes I'll strive over one image for a long time, or a project like the play. <laughs> but um, sometimes it's like an hour or two later, an hour or two later and I finish the piece, you know? What is your favorite work? Um, oh, you mean of... Of yours. Oh. Of oh. your own. And I, I know that's an unfair question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, but... Yeah. If you can answer it. No, I do. I do have a piece. It was actually the last painting that I painted in Puerto Rico. And uh, right before I came here, I came back to the United States. Um, 1987, I believe. 86. 1986. Um, and it's... Uh, a portrait of Christ uh, um, on the cross in the crucifixion, close up. That I, um, I I I got the image from an old movie still from the 1930s, and it was really a black and white movie. Uh, but I painted it in tones of brown um, on the back of a um, a piece of wood. I, I used to paint signs to make to make money. I, I painted signs. I made posters. You know how it is. I, I did calligraphy, whatever. You know, to make a buck. Um, and that's another way that art has always maintained me. Um, but uh, I, uh, I had a sign for Taco Maker. I actually worked for them too. <laughs> but um, in the back of a Taco Maker sign that I had, I painted this portrait, and I still have it. And a lot of people have want to ask me to buy it, but it's you know, um, for some reason I um, I identify with it, and it was also right after I left the seminary. So I think that there's all so these. Is that a, a benchmark in your life? Yes. So it has a lot of meaning for you, yeah. aside from the obvious yes, artistic. Yes, 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 yes. How do you overcome creative blocks? Well, you know what's interesting? What's, I think what has saved me is being a teaching artist. Because you always have to teach other kids, you know, you're doing projects, you're always so they, they kind of always keep me on a, 
on a roll. But there are creative blocks, like for example, with the writing, like with this piece. Um, some of it is um, personal, like uh, like emotional, you know, connections. Like Linda um, provoked a lot of thoughts about my old man. My old man um, died the same year that I started writing Linda. Wow. Like one of those ironies of life. He was in this apartment with my mother and I was in their house upstate. Wow. I had cards all over the wall with the ideas for the play. I had little in there that I've been writing. Storyboards. Storyboarding. Mm -hmm. When I got the call. So look at Amazonas Cosa. And I think that that had a lot to do with that, that block. Um, so that block, that kind of a block, like getting an emotional artistic block, El Tiempo. And the process. It's like you know, right now I think I'm really, I'm really I'm thinking like one of the reasons I think for upstate also is this. To finish this project. But then there's other blocks like when you have a project to finish and you have to do it and you just, you know but like for me two things I, I meditate and that really helps. Because sometimes it's just some too many things happening, too many thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and when I quit smoking in two thousand and seven I was diagnosed with A D D. Which made a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea, but she told me that, you know, a lot of people, um, especially my age, weren't diagnosed because there really wasn't much of a diagnosis, even though, um, like, the Ritalin has been on the market for over 50 years, mm -hmm. and the safety record is pretty good for, for that drug, um, and she told me something interesting, that 80% of art makers have ADD. She said, if not more. And she goes, even if you go back and read stuff that was written by like Michelangelo and all these guys, mm -hmm. she goes, you can make an ADD diagnosis just based on their writings. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another way of thinking and, um, and, and I've been dealing with it. So that, that forces me to, you know, to, to deal. And uh, meditation helps and, um, you know, that deep breathing and that stopping all the... And interestingly enough, there are all these scientific studies now, because uh, I've been looking at, you know, substitutes for Ritalin, and you know what, uh, the only thing that is just as effective is meditation. Oh, and, and that's something you and that's something you're doing. I, and I've been doing it for like, well, I've been doing it all my life on and off since mm -hmm. the seminary days. So you probably knew that organically. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting? You know. That's interesting. So, oh. so on, the, on the other hand, on the other end of overcoming creative blocks, how do you determine when a work is finished? Oh my God, that's another good question because that's very hard. Especially when I do installation work because I'll, I'll have a design and, it's, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm pretty, you know, I think I'm pretty good at, you know, where everything's going to go and being exact with my design. But then once you get there and you start setting up and things start happening um, or you're finishing up a piece. And all of a sudden, you know, you're like, no, this is not, you know, there's something that doesn't feel that's right. off. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't feel right. And you're thinking, no, I don't. And I, 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 sometimes I work on a piece for a long time and then I just put it aside with this. And then, you know, especially for installation work. Like a lot of the stuff here, like the table, the piece you saw when you came in, that's all part of installation. Um, and, and my installations always have a lot of elements, you know, but, um, and, and, um, and I've always thought that, for example, as an art maker, I can, I can, you know, use a found object, but I'm not going to drag a table off the street and just put it there. Like, for me, I have to work the table, either with mosaic or paint it or do something. Because then I think that I'm transforming it into an object of art, you know? And it's still a functional object, but it's been you know, given another, an, another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's been transformed. It's been transformed because I've gone to installations and it's just stuff that people pick up and they just put together. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered, I mean, I understand, like as an art maker, the process, but, uh, but like, I always thought that that's not as intimate as you putting your mark on it, you know? It's just, you just gather all the stuff and put it together, that's nice, but where are you? Mm -hmm. You know, as the art maker. Apart from the, I'm, I'm a little more visual too, I, I can't be so, too esoteric. Too, you know. <laughs> How has your craft developed over time? 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, um, I think that art makers, like any, any profession, a teacher, a doctor, um, you're continually learning. You're continually learning. You're always learning new techniques. And, um, an interesting thing is that I've realized through the years, not just me, but art makers in general, they, they do many kinds of art. They don't limit themselves to one medium. And I think that that's important in art because you have to, you know, like I've done the same image, you know, three-dimensionally and on paper and on, you know. So, you know, I think that you, that, that kind of experimentation is important. So I think that by meeting other artists, like in the printmaking workshop and um, throughout your life, you know, like uh, my friend Virginia, that I was just talking about the muralist, um, you know, you, uh, you see how different artists manipulate different materials and that, that, that starts influencing your work and your art and you start experimenting and you become, you know, and you start realizing that there's different ways to work and so I think that that's really made my art deeper and richer and, um, and more, uh, more organic in, in the, you know, that I can, you know, I can sit down and glue, I can sit down and sew, I can sit down and paint, all right, and it's the same thing. But it, 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 all of that is influenced, you know. Like, you know, Tato influenced my writing, a lot of people who influenced my writing, a lot of people influenced my writing, you know, the artists that influenced my art. How do you feel when you finish your work, especially a, like a big project? It's funny, um, sometimes you're frustrated. It's like, uh, it's like almost anticlimactic because you go and you go, like, um, with theater. You bust your chops and then all of a sudden the play is over. And it's very anticlimactic. It's like you miss all the process of getting there. And I think that with art making it's the same thing in certain ways. Like uh, like a lot of my installations, I uh, I invite poets or, uh, or I bring in actors or musicians. So that becomes like a, a mini performative performance kind of experience. Um, and again, then it's over. Um, even if you tape it and you leave it there for people to see what happened in the space, it's not the same thing the same experience so I think that ironically I always feel like a little sad <laughs> when I'm done you know like some people are like, oh I finished this I'm just a little sad that you know that that's it it's and like then a little I, melancholy yeah melancholy melancholy yeah melancholy it's like, the way you describe it it's almost like um, like a, a bride at, at their wedding reception you know like um, you know like a bride will you know um uh, prepare for months or more than a year and there's all this all these emotions are and the closer you get the more the emotions uh -huh. are like all, all over the place and then the the wedding comes great and the reception comes and it's like it's before you know it it's over and then it's like it's almost like a anticlimactic yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like what <laughs> that's why when you said that, that's, that's what funny. it reminded That's a great that's metaphor. I think it's, I think it's yeah. exactly that. Mm -hmm. Exactly that. You know, but then, you know, you pick up another project and start all over. Start all over. <laughs> right. So, what was your uh, best experience as an artist? My best experience? Well, I mean, I, I've been lucky because I've had a lot of such incredible experiences in my life as an art maker. Um, my first really big experience was in theater in Puerto Rico um, when I was in college. This is when I was in my seminary days. And uh, and it's funny because we used to sneak out of the seminary, another seminary, and I would be in this play because that, that was against the rules. And eventually we had to get permission from the bishop to do it because we were violating the rules. You know, so. <laughs> But the, the play was based on, um, I wrote it in a weekend when we were doing a retreat. It was based on uh, an American writer, James Thurber's comic strip called The Last Flower. And uh, he starts with the 10th World War. I think it's the 10th World War or the 3rd World War. 
as everybody knows. Um, but I was in a seminary and we were, so we used that idea, but we started with the creation with Adam and Eve and followed the trajectory. And um, so that rewriting of it, it became a, an hour and a half piece in pantomime, 42 actors from La Universidad Católica de Puerto Rico, from the different departments. Uh, the students hadn't done a theater production there in over a decade. There was no theater department. No theater period. They had an auditorium, that's where we did it. Um, and it was incredible because we use multimedia, we use video. I mean, multimedia back then, I mean, slicing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible, and everybody committed. And we had to go sneak back into the seminary. My co director, Evelyn Okendo, she would stay up with the guys in technology all night, splicing together a minute here, a minute there from different recordings for the soundtrack. Um, you know, we got uh, a professor of psychology who had a radio program, had an incredible voice. I thought it was a guy at first. I go, I want that guy to be my narrator. And my friend goes, that's a woman. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce it to her. And we became best friends. So she's a, she added something to the piece. And we, it became like a movement because we became a big deal, and then people started seeing our rehearsals, and by the time we went up, we had a lot of support in the university, and um, and the piece was political, you know, it even criticized the church, mm -hmm. um, and we used slides and videos and images and, you know, sound effects, and, and all in movement, no speaking, mm -hmm. an hour and a half, just the narration. So I think that that was one of the most um, fulfilling um, experiences for me, in, you know, in art, because it had everything. It had all the art forms coming together, you know, um, and also very um, modern. You know, back then it was like a big deal. And, uh, and I think that that really stimulated me also to think bigger when it came. Because I remember doing the lighting in Teatro La Perla. We eventually took it to the Teatro La Perla in Ponce. And uh, uh, Lumino Tecnico, the, the lighting uh, director, he told me, have you ever done film? I go, no, why? He goes, because your vision is cinemascopic. But he was talking yeah. about that, okay. that big, you uh -huh. know, picture. So that's interesting, right? That, uh, um, so I think that that was the most satisfying for me. Of, and then, you know, coming here and, um, you know, all the experiences I've had, you know, working with different, um, you know, institutions, I, I um, commissions with City Law after 9/11, and with uh, Manera Martinez for uh, uh, Que Bonita Bandera, the, uh, the Puerto Rican flag is folk art. Uh, they commissioned me for an installation. Uh, my installation was called Más Bonita Se Viera, punto punto punto, <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, an homenaje to Pedro Albizu Campo. I did an exhibit years ago at Longwood Arts Gallery. And uh, talking about found out, I found a, one of those old wooden closets that looked like a coffin. <laughs> an armoire? Yeah. It's like an armoire. Yeah, like an armoire. And I dragged it in, and um, and I made a piece about homophobia. Ah. And, you know, and I painted it black inside, and all these ugly words, and all this stuff, and then you know stuff on the outside. And um, and I remember that Juan Sanchez, Juan Sanchez, and he. Um, and uh, he uh, he did a little write up about it, and he and he mentioned that he said that um, um, that um, it was right there in your face, but it was rare back then. This is like ninety in the early nineties for Puerto Rican artists to you know talk about their homosexuality. <laughs> you know? So that made me feel good. <laughs> you know? The pioneer in that you know? in that is. Yeah. in that respect. What was your worst experience as an artist? Hmm. That's a difficult question to answer. My worst experience as an artist. Um, there's probably a few of them, but I think like one of the worst experiences was as a teaching artist when um, when I first started, I was working for an organization, I don't know why name, in, in the South Bronx back in the day. And uh, um, they've been around since like the 60s. It was uh, doing theater with kids and stuff. 
Uh, but the director was not the. I don't know. I don't know if I should even. Because I told him the way I said. <laughs> Let me think of another one. Well, you don't have to mention. You don't have to mention names or yeah, anything. Yeah, you just yeah. mentioned the what happened. Yeah. Well, the situation, know, the situation was that um, they want you to do theater with kids and everything, but then there's no support. There's no no real like economic support, moral support. I mean, everything, everything. And we busted our chops to get this production up one year. And. Um, You know, there was no, you know, nothing. There was no, um, no recognition, no, um, you know. And the following year, um, a relative of the, the man directing the program came in to direct the play and was given like a, an incredibly obscene amount of money. <laughs> and uh, so that, you know, that was one of the. The other one, which is, kind of related to, uh, and it was a little bit about uh, politics and stuff, was that um, uh, we uh, we did a summer program with youth, a theater program, a beautiful program at Ostos. Um, and we uh, we had a contract with uh, a, pol a politician from the South Bronx, and she never paid us. And we worked two months, and we had to get a lawyer and bring her to court. court. Yeah, eventually we got paid, but it took over a year. And that summer, you know, we're teaching artists, working, you know, check to check. So we had to borrow money from relatives and everything to pay our rent and do all that. That's right. so. And that was, I think those were the two worst experiences <laughs> <laughs> as an art maker. talked about um, some of the projects that you've done in the past. Um, what projects uh, are you thinking of or planning to work on uh, going forward? Okay. Well, um, Linda, the play, the musical that I've been working on, is one of the main projects I'm going to, you know, this is my commitment. Because it's interesting, you know, um, I knew this woman all these years. She made me the executor of her will. And before she died, she told me, Nanny. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, oh, <laughs> and it's funny because she never presented me as an art maker. She always presented me as an escritor. <laughs> 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 so that project, I'm going to finish. And you know, a quick anecdote. A year after she passed, her, um, her home attendant, who's a, a woman from uh, Guatemala, I think, she's the one who gave her this cat. This is her cat that I adopted. Mm -hmm. um, she calls me, she goes, Ay, uh, Señor George, estuve en sueño con Linda. Y yo, sí, ¿qué pasó? She goes, Ella me dijo que le dijera que terminara la obra. <laughs> That's funny. And I told her, Eso no fue un sueño. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one project that um, that I really want to finish, and also because I think it's um, it started out being the story of her life, but it's really the story of the New Yorican and how we got here. Because she was one of the first real New Yorkans, you know. Because there's New Yorkans that came here young from Puerto Rico, there's New Yorkans born here. So that's a whole other thing with the New Yorican thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot of that with Tato La Viera and me and with Caridad de la Luz. Um, then I, um, I'm working on um, an installation that deals more specifically with like homophobia and uh, because that was really a big part of my growing up and, and it's like, it's like, you know, living in fear basically, you know, when you think about a lot of these. So that's what I was uh, referring to a little bit before saying in the words I might do something dark, <laughs> but, it was, but it was, you know, reflecting on those things. And, um, and uh, I've had, I have these designs for years and I even have a title that's going to be called Pato el que quiera escuchar. <laughs> <laughs> and in English, that translates to... Forget about it, now. <laughs> um, for all who want to hear, but in Puerto Rico, the word pato is a slur for homosexuals, uh, a duck, because ducks walk. Not often. But I'm playing with the word. So, you know, pato el que quiera escuchar. <laughs> 
so those are my two main projects right now. Um, and I'm also, um, you know, trying to figure out ways now that I'm going to be living in differently, how to make um, more um, more time just to to make art and to exhibit it and to, you know, like upstate, when I go upstate, my nieces especially wanted me to, you know. And, um, and also I'm going to start um, uh, merchandising some of my images, like in shirts and stuff. Um, uh, as a way to um, to make money, which is important, but also I think as a way to, like my niece told me, to so more people see the work. This is Mind Builders Creative Arts Center, my um, other job, and I'm uh, the creative, uh, the um, interim director of the Folk Culture Community Program, Dr. Beverly J. Robinson Community Folk Culture Program. This is my fifth and last year here, and today we have um, a big annual open house um, festival and uh, art exhibit, which I am actually curating and hanging. I hung yesterday. Um, so, um, and I'm here uh, trying to get stuff done for my, um, for the exhibit today. Normally I'm the interim director of the Folk Culture Program here at Mind Builders, but today um, my role is curating and uh, the curator of this show, which I also hung. Um, this is a young artist, uh, young art makers exhibit, the first annual exhibit here at Mind Builders. It's going to be an yearly thing after this year. And uh, we had an open call for young people, um, um, 14, well, we actually have a 12-year-old, uh, but young people up to 28, um, young artists. And it was an open call, um, no theme, um, any art they wanted to submit up to three pieces. And so we have mostly three pieces from each artist. Some of them donated one. Um, and what's interesting about the work is, um, well, first of all, that a lot of these students were full culture students of mine, so I'm really proud of them um, and coming through. And um, hopefully this is the beginning of a um, visual arts project program here at Mind Builders. So um, the art is from, I have students who were here five years ago when I started, students who just came in this year, and then uh, young people that I haven't met yet. Um, if you go around and look at the art, it's incredibly beautiful, but it's also very political, very socially aware. Um, and an interesting thing is that we didn't have a theme for the show. So this is just what's happening to our young people today and what's in their head. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful statement of um, awareness. And I think a lot of the work that we do here, which is looking at our past to um, understand our present and to look at where we're going to be in the future. Did any of these students have uh, art experience before they came um, into the class? A lot of these students, the only art experience they've had is high school taking art classes. These are like the, a lot of these kids are the kids that always love the arts. Um, but never followed it. There is one young lady, Diane Williams, who's um, one of our oldest artists, she's 27, <laughs> and um, she's been making art since I've known her. And I do believe that she's taken some art classes in college. She graduated from college recently, uh, but not in art. But I think she had a minor in art. Um, and uh, these are actually her pieces here, which are very um, uh, incredible and deep and political. It's uh, an original hand drawing by her, and then two prints that she had professionally made because she wanted to keep the canvases. And um, part of the project that we did here was basically to um, uh, hang the work, but also to frame the work um, and to present it in a professional setting so that a lot of them, this is their first exhibit, um, so that they have a sense of what it means um, to exhibit your work and how it should be exhibited. Uh, this is all, you know, eye level, all very, you know, done as much to the book as we can do it. Um, and also, they get 100% of the proceeds. So we're not um, charging anything at all for the services. This is Mind Builders' gift to the young people from the community. So is this um, the, uh, what are the demographics for your students? The demographics are mostly um, African American, um, Latino, um, uh, kids from um, the Middle East, from Bangladesh, from India. Uh, but, and for, so that's basically the demographics. We have had, um, 
Caucasian children in the past, so you know we don't discriminate. But basically, because this is the North Bronx, uh, there's a, also a very big um, African immigrant community here. So a lot of my kids are uh, recent African immigrants. Uh, this past summer, we had a young girl who was uh, uh, part of the unaccompanied minors program. She literally crossed the border. So uh, she literally crossed the border um, to come here, spend a year in Texas, and uh, was part of our program this year. What is your dream project? My dream project is Linda. Finishing Linda. It's a time thing too because um, it's a musical, it has a lot of people. It's, um, you know, one of the things I love about theater is that it brings all the art forms together. Um, and I would love for um, Rita Moreno to play Linda. Well, and she's already in her 70s. So it would have to be, you know. Because the play um, is narrated by Linda, who's uh, in her 80s. She died when she was 82. And that's another thing I love about the play, that it's an older woman telling the story, her story. Well, since Rita's getting up there in the years, that, that, that probably would put like a little bit of a fire and yes. a deadline under you to, you know, sort of... Exactly. Well, we were talking before, yeah. before about the beginning of <laughs> right, yeah. that's, that's why I, That's why I read it before, said, when I get up there, I have to do this quick. <laughs> What would you like to accomplish with your work? Um, well, I would like to... Hopefully, it's, it'll inspire people um, or educate people, you know, the work itself. Um, the production of the work, for me, I would like to... That um, it, 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 Basically, my work has sustained me until now, but I would like to to be able to make more money from it so that I can invest more in in the projects, you know, that, that, that will come up in the future, you know, like with Linda and all of that. So, so because um, I think that, um, like, I, I've never believed in a starving artist mentality. Mm -hmm. um, because people, you know, and a few of my friends said, oh, you're a starving artist, but, you know, because they're, you know, they work on Wall Street and stuff, and so they're, their economic worldview is different from mine. But I tell them, I'm not starving on this, you know. Well, also, their idea of uh, success is it's different. different. It's very different. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, for the work to to enlighten people and also to, to provide me the opportunity to make more of it, you know, mm -hmm. on, on a different scale. Why did you join Frida? Frida. Well, I joined, you know, it's funny, I, before I joined Preda, I've been meaning to join it for like years, because I've known Luis forever. 
And um, and I know so many artists in Frida, and I went to so many Frida events. And um, part of it, I maybe because of the ADD, that I didn't do it earlier. <laughs> um, but the reason I did it is because um, I think it's important to be part of a of a, of a collective like this, you know, a collective of uh, you know Puerto Rican artists and art makers, and also for the Frida has a, all kinds of art makers. You know, there's not one specific type, genre, genre yeah, and, and I love it, you know, from, you know, writers and performing, performing artists. artists and, you know, all kinds of um, visual, uh, artists. visual artists, you know, and um, so, so I think that that's important. And also the camaraderie of it, you know, and participating and, um, and I think that's important, and especially in our community, to, to have that support, you know. So, um, so I'm really happy that I did, and, and the opportunities, like I just had recently the opportunity to exhibit, you know, thanks to Frida, and, um, and Frida does that for all the artists, which is incredible. So I think that, um, you know, I'm glad I joined, and I think that's an important organization because it does provide a, a networking tool for everybody, um, but also, uh, you know, uh, you know, meta mano, parante. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Support encouragement. Yeah, yeah support encouragement. encouragement. What advice do you have for an aspiring artist? Um, follow your heart. Find whatever you're passionate about and jump in don't even think about it um, and while you do it find a way to get paid for it you know and, and that's you know I know so many young artists now and they're doing it you know it's, you just have to be a little smart you know but I think if I think that uh, there's a difference between uh, a profession and a vocation and I think art makers is a vocation you know it's, you know, you were born to do this. You have to do it. So then you have to find a way to make it work. You know, I was told all my life, Art, Neil, you're going to be miserable. And I've been blessed, you know. Mm -hmm. Like we were saying before, like well, some of my friends are like, oh, I'm like, I'm not a starving artist. You know, I live in New York City, have my own apartment, I've traveled all over the world. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty lucky. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention that I have not asked you? Anything else I'd like to mention that you have not asked me? Um, well, you know, um, working in, like, working in um, Spanish Harlem all these years, and you know, I'm not going to wax poetic about the artists in the art scene. I mean, we're Boricuas and we're hot-headed and we're passionate, <laughs> <You know? laughs> But art makers are art makers are art makers. And, um, and I've learned that, you know? And, and, and you can love somebody who's a curmudgeon, <laughs> you know, um, through their art, yeah. you know? So to me, that, that's been like the biggest learning and what I'm taking upstate with me from El Barrio, you know, and all the incredibly esoteric and, and diverse um, art makers that we have here. A beautiful, beautiful bunch of locals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George, thank you for inviting me into your creative space. Thank you so much. Thank you, my love. And thank you for this moment. I appreciate it.